Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 World Happiness Report session. Um, welcome, everyone. We're so very happy that you can join us for International Day of Happiness. Um, before we start, I'd really like to thank our partners that help make this report and the work that we do possible. Um, not only do we have institutions involved and editors and authors, but we have um, people supporting us to make this work. We uh, would like to thank our data partner, Gallup. Um, also, our partners that were able to help with Gallup was uh, the Lloyd's Register Foundation this year, also the COVID Data Hub with YouGov. And we also have our very special partners, the Blue Chip Foundation with Jen Gross, uh, the Ernesto Illy Foundation, Illy Cafe, uh, the Davines Group, which also includes Comfort Zone. We have Unilever, um, their largest ice cream brand, Walls. We also have the Happier Way Foundation and also Indeed, uh, where you can find them at indeed.com. Thank you very much for joining and we'll start and we will start with Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Thank you. Thank you all for joining today and uh, very happy World Happiness Day. Uh, thank you, Sharon, for your great uh, management and leadership of this whole process, uh, getting us to uh, today's workshop. Uh, this has uh, been a, a, a tremendous uh, amount of work under these very unusual circumstances. I also want to join in uh, thanking our partners uh, who are uh, vital for every part of this work and an inspiration for us uh, and invaluable in advice and content uh, and every other kind of support. I hope people are doing well uh, this is uh, definitely the strangest uh, year uh, in our lives, I think, for most of us, and also the strangest year of producing the World Happiness Report, because uh, we have been trying uh, in real time to understand and monitor an incredibly complex uh, set of challenges and changes that people around the world are facing. Uh, our partner uh, Gallup uh, has made a valiant uh, effort to continue to collect uh, data uh, in a very, very challenging set of circumstances, uh, obviously, uh, where uh, usual survey methods uh, could not uh, be undertaken and where we are not moving around as normally we would. And of course, uh, as the authors will describe uh, shortly the impacts of COVID-19 have differed uh, so widely across different groups in society that we should be very careful and cautious in any and all statements, especially because this is also still a very deep, very complex and rapidly unfolding pandemic. Uh, every day bringing good news in some places, bringing more difficult news in other places, bringing challenges everywhere. And uh, the report provides uh, an analysis and snapshot of this uh, complicated story. Uh, I'd like to remind us uh, as we are in 2021 that this is the 10th anniversary of uh, a breakthrough resolution of the UN General Assembly that got our World Health Report, uh, World Happiness Report, excuse me, started uh, in 2012, um, and that was the basis and inspiration of it. Uh, in uh, July 2011, the UN General Assembly adopted uh, a resolution, a 65th session, Resolution 309, Happiness Towards a Holistic Approach to Development. And uh, this resolution uh, said that because the pursuit of happiness is a fundamental human goal, uh, it invites member states to pursue the elaboration of additional measures that better capture the importance of the pursuit of happiness and well being in development with a view towards guiding their public policies. And it invites member states to develop new indicators and other initiatives and to share this information thereon uh, with the Secretary General as a contribution uh, to the United Nations development agenda. So it was in that basis that uh, I'm so thrilled that uh, my colleagues uh, got 
uh, started, uh, we got started together, the World Happiness Report. Uh, and uh, it's an uh, honor for me to be working with all of the co-editors who, whom you'll uh, see on screen in just a moment. But let me say thank you for this 10-year adventure. Uh, and I would say that this resolution of the General Assembly has had an effect throughout the world. It's not sure that the world is happier now, but the world is more focused on happiness and well-being without question than it was 10 years ago. And that by itself offers us a hope that we can turn this better understanding into real happiness around the world. That certainly is the goal of the World Happiness Report. So thank you very, very much uh, to all of the contributors and to all of the participants in today's workshop. Uh, let me now uh, give a warm welcome to our crucial partner and our partner from the start, John Clifton of Gallup, uh, whose leadership uh, has seen the way to collect this uh, wonderful, unique uh, set of data on uh, well-being uh, that is collected uh, in uh, countries all over the world every year. John, thank you also so much for the extra efforts uh, that Gallup made uh, this year to make sure that we would be able to uh, track this uh, very complicated uh, and uh, difficult uh, period because it's more important than ever that we have uh, this information at hand. John, thank you for being partner with us. Thank you for your leadership and over to you. Jeff, thank you for those really kind words. Also, Jeff, thank you for your leadership. On behalf of everyone at Gallup, thank you to you and every single person that's presenting today because these data do not come alive without your analysis. So thank you again for your leadership. There's another group of people that I wanna make sure that, uh, that I thank and that everyone from Gallup wants to thank. And that's the more than 5,000 interviewers that literally walk this planet in order to make sure that people's voices in terms of how they represent, how their lives are going, are represented in this report. So on behalf of Gallup, we would like to say thank you to the more than 5,000 interviewers that we work with that make this possible. I wanna say one other quick thing because I believe that this research has unearthed one of the most significant findings uh, that's relevant to the world today. And it's a concept known as happiness inequality. Now, what is happiness inequality? We know that 15 years ago when we started doing this research, we found that people in the top 20% said their lives were an eight. Today, they say their lives are a nine. Now, what does that look like compared to the people who have it the worst? 15 years ago, people who in the bottom 20% said their lives were at three, but today they say their lives are at two. That means that gap has gone from a five to a seven. Now, we know that income inequality is a major contributor to happiness inequality, but it's not everything. Take, for example, the very concept of loneliness, which we know that COVID-19 is only exacerbated. Right now, loneliness, when Gallup asks people, whether or not they had a time in the past week where they were unable to spend at least a single hour with a friend or a family member, we find that over 300 million people in the world, which is of course the same size as the United States, experience that kind of loneliness where they don't spend a single hour with a single friend. That's one of the biggest contributors to what's widening this gap because the people who have a great life, the people who say that they're a nine, look very differently than the people who say that they're a two. What I think is so amazing about this report is this is where we can start in order to make the people who say that their lives are at two to make their lives better. So thank you again to everyone that's contributed. Thank you to everyone who's joined us today to figure out how to make those, life, those people's lives better. Thank you again, Jeff. Thank you very much, Jeff and John. Um, we'll now begin the part of our agenda today where we hear from our chapter authors providing the highlights of their work. So we'll begin with Professor Halliwell covering chapter two. What a challenge it has been to collect the data uh, and Gallup gets all our praise for launching what are quite extraordinary efforts to do that. <clears throat> this session's in two parts. So this is very brief. I'm gonna be giving you now and then we'll be coming back later and going more deeply into the data. 
first thing I want to do for the watchers uh, is to tell you about the structure of the report this year. We essentially have uh, two main focuses. One is how have lives changed and been affected by COVID itself? And the other half of the volume is how have nations responded to COVID and what can we say as happiness researchers about the methods they've used and their success. They're quite different. So chapter two does a bit of both effects of uh, COVID on happiness and uh, what are the things that have uh, supported the more successful COVID strategies around the world. <clears throat> the first part will be followed later by uh, chapters five, six, and seven dealing with the uh, mental health, the social connections, and the workplace uh, aspects of the uh, pandemic effects. So uh, they're going to be more detailed, and then I'll come back later and talk about how they mesh together. Then on the effect side, on the po policy analysis side, uh, the first thing, uh, well, that'll be handled in both chapters two, uh, sorry, three and four. Uh, both of them dealing with the uh, way in which the Asia Pacific countries had differed from the North Atlantic countries. In chapter uh, two, uh, the analysis is more purely on a global basis. Let me give you a couple of highlights because I've got a couple of minutes. Uh, the uh, first is that to an astonishing extent, uh, the uh, life evaluations, first thing to remind you is that we essentially collect and emphasize in the reports uh, three dimensions of subjective well-being. Life evaluations, which in our uh, Gallup-based analysis is an answer to a question, how do you evaluate your life as a whole these days on thinking of it as a ladder with zero the worst and 10 the best. Those uh, life evaluations have been astonishingly resilient under COVID, which surprised us. Uh, and uh, we were glad, especially also, that we could look at the underpinnings more carefully this time and look at emotions, positive and negative, uh, during the pandemic. And we found the biggest effects uh, on, on negative emotions. And you'll be hearing about that both in the social connections chapter and in the mental health chapter. Uh, and also we find the emotions go up and down more and the life evaluations tend to be on a, uh, on a, on a more stable platform. We wondered in the beginning whether we could have any kind of ranking analysis at all this year uh, because uh, we didn't know whether we can get enough surveys and whether we could make enough of the one year. What we found with the stability that we carry on with our regular ranking, which is what you'll find on the website. And of course, uh, because on general countries haven't changed very much, our rankings from last year to this year are very, very similar. Uh, <clears throat> and then we dig down in our microanalysis to look at which population groups within each country uh, have been affected. And that's what I'll come and talk about later. We find trust is a major link between the original effects uh, and uh, the effects of happiness on COVID and uh, the factors that determine success in handling COVID. Uh, and so two kinds of trust are important. How much you trust and believe in the well, in the ability and willingness of others to reach out and help you. And secondly, what kind of trust do you have in your national institutions confidence in your national institutions. It turns out that both are extraordinarily important for life evaluations. We now know from the uh, uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation data that to think your wallet will be returned uh, to you if found by a stranger and a neighbor, thinking it very likely, takes you up a full point on the uh, zero to 10 scale. And that's more than the effects of uh, any of the negative risks that that poll talks about from fear of mental illness to uh, violent crime. Uh, so this positive support, we also then in the third part of the chapter find out is extraordinarily important in, in supporting successful COVID.
COVID strategies, uh, which as you will find out from the next uh, presentation, uh, are quite unequivocal. The results in all three of our chapters are that there was only one really successful strategy, and that was to drive community transmission to zero and keep it there and, and thereby avoid subsequent uh, moves. I think now that's the right time to turn and find out from the East Asian and Pacific uh, evidence what the secret was. Thank you and see you later on. Thank you very much for those highlights, Dr. Halliwell. Um, next, we will see a video from our chapter authors um, of chapter three, Professor Ma, who will be talking about COVID-19 prevalence and well-being lessons from East Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Mimi Ma. I'm an assistant professor at Shanghai University of Finance and Economics. Today, I'm very happy to present the highlights of the third chapter of this year's World Happiness Report, COVID-19 Prevalence and Well-Being, Lessons from East Asia. This work was collaborated with Shun Wang from KDI School of Public Policy and Management and Feng Yu Wu from Wake Forest University. In this chapter, we started with the fact that East Asian regions, including mainland China, Hong Kong SAR, Taiwan province of China, Japan, and South Korea were more successful in the fight against COVID-19, shown by their much lower cumulative COVID-19 infection rates compared with many of the Western countries. Then we show that strong government responses played a crucial role in their more successful control of COVID-19. We find that East Asia had stricter mobility control and physical distancing policies at the early stage of the outbreaks. Testing and contact tracing had also been more aggressive in East Asia. A closer look further reveals that most of the East Asian regions adopted a restructured response system and a multi-prone approach, where under national directive, multi-sector efforts were coordinated with cooperation from all levels of governments an array of interventions were implemented, including, but not limited to, comprehensive mobility controls, extensive testing, tracing, free treatment, mandated quarantine, and enforced self-protection practice. In particular, extensive testing and tracing capacity allow for more dynamic response and precise control of COVID-19 during subsequent waves. From a cultural perspective, we also see that East Asian regions tend to have lower levels of individualism and higher levels of long-term orientation and restraint, which leads to more responsible civic engagement in fighting the pandemic. However, we also show that COVID-19 can be successfully contained in countries with cultures quite different from those of East Asia, such as Australia and New Zealand, suggesting decisive and timely government responses might be more important than cultural traits. Last but not least, East Asia also experienced changes and fluctuations in national happiness due to the spread of COVID-19 and restrictive government policies. Using social media data and Google Trends data, we find that Daily new COVID-19 infection was associated with lower daily level of expressed happiness. While more restringent government policy on average is detrimental to happiness, these policies were also protective of people's happiness when infection rates were high in the country and therefore helped mitigate the negative effects of the spread of COVID-19. To sum it up, the lessons in East Asia point to the importance of strong government response systems, as well as a robust combination of vigorous non-pharmaceutical and pharmaceutical measures in fighting COVID-19 and protecting people's happiness during the pandemic. A more detailed presentation of chapter three will be given by Feng Yu, and I hope this chapter could contribute to the understanding of anti COVID-19 policymaking and how these policies relate to the overall well-being in East Asia. Thank you. Right, that's a lovely video to summarize chapter 
um, chapter three of the report. We'll now turn to another pre-recorded video from chapter five by Professor Banks, who will cover highlights from chapter five on mental health and the COVID-19 pandemic. Hello, my name is James Banks, and I'm going to tell you about chapter five of the report, which looks at the effect of the pandemic on mental health. This chapter is joint work with uh, Zhao Wei Zhu from the Institute for Fiscal Studies and Daisy Fangor from UCL. The chapter begins by looking at the time frame by which these mental health effects might play out. We could think of short run effects for, related to the way in which uh, the lockdown itself, the fear of the virus and the adversities created by the pandemic lockdown might be affecting mental health. Or we could think of more medium to long run effects which are related to the demand and supply of mental health services or indeed the longer run consequences of the economic and social impact of the virus. Now we might also want to think about the way in which or the mechanisms and stresses by which uh, people are affected. So for example different people will be differentially worried about their health, the economic situation, their family living or caring arrangements or indeed their social contact and network and all of these things might translate into mental health uh, differentially. Uh, and so the full effects of the pandemic are going to be very complex to understand. Having set this all out, we'll turn to look at some of the evidence that's been emerging. Of course, there are many different studies and data sources all around the world with different measures of mental health. Um, and it's worth saying that the existing analyses focus predominantly on richer ca um, countries and indeed countries with better data. Uh, and also mainly on adults, partly because of the, the difficulties of measuring mental health in children, which is not to say that the potential effects of the virus on children's mental health couldn't be a very important dimension to understand. It's also worth noting when thinking about the effects of the virus, uh, we need to have some idea of what would have happened anyway without COVID-19. We know that mental health has been trending around the world differentially for different groups and in different countries. And we also know that mental health depends on the week or the month of the year in which it's assessed. So if we just looked at the mental health in a particular country in a month and compared that to what had happened in the past, we wouldn't really be seeing the effect of the pandemic. We have to understand these pre-existing trends first. So what, ha what do we see in the emerging themes? Well, one thing we see is for sure large initial negative effects on mental health in the first few months of the virus, March, April, May 2020. I won't set them out here, there's much more detail in the chapter. Looking further though, what we see is by September, if you follow these same people, there had been substantial recovery to the extent that actually, although maybe mental health hadn't returned quite to what it would have been in the absence of COVID, uh, the neg negative effects were much smaller than they were in March, April or May. And indeed, we noticed that some groups, and in particular the young, had recovered much more in this respect. Uh, this issue of different effects across different groups is a, very, is a theme that comes out in the chapter. And of course, as with other aspects of the pandemic, we found that some old inequalities or inequalities that we already knew about have been amplified and reinforced. But we've also seen that some other new inequalities have been emerged. I'm going to finish just by saying, first of all, that our data cover only the period up to October 20. Since then, we've seen further variants of the virus and further lockdowns in response to it, but also the success and the gradual rollout of vaccination programmes, all of which we might expect to have further effects. So we're going to need to continue to study and monitor mental health trends going forward. Not least because the longer term effects are yet to play out, those are identified in my initial diagram, which are related to the changing demand supply of mental health self-services and the longer term mental health consequences of recession and social change. On the positive side, I think we've seen over the course of this pandemic that mental health has risen to the top of the agenda of many policymakers and of researchers in many disciplines. And uh, this is going to be a very important and uh, probably a very important development when thinking about what kind of policies should be introduced as countries build back uh, in response to the pandemic. That's all I'm going to say for now. Thanks very much for your attention. I hope you enjoy reading the chapter and we're delighted to have been able to contribute to this important volume. Thank you. Um, we will now be moving to a video, a pre-recorded video um, from chapter six by Ms. Okabe Miyamoto, who will be talking about social connection and well-being during COVID-19. Hi everyone, my name is Karina Okabe Miyamoto and I'm a PhD student working with Sonia Lewomirsky at UC Riverside. 
Our chapter for the World Happiness Report focuses on changes in both social connection and well-being during the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're happy to share some highlights from our chapter here today. So given the plethora of research that has been published in 2020, we were able to touch upon both the protective and the risk factors for both social connection or a sense of belonging and closeness with others, as well as well-being or experiencing more positive than negative affect and feeling satisfied with your life. And something that jumped out during our search of the literature was the seemingly uh, conflicting findings that have been published so far as to whether social connection and well-being have increased, decreased, or remained the same during the pandemic. So for example, US participants who reported distancing more also reported increases in a host of negative outcomes such as depressive symptoms and generalized anxiety disorder. And in a sample of both US and UK participants, those who reported increases in loneliness from before to during the pandemic also reported mere decreases in life satisfaction. On the other hand, however, other research has found that life satisfaction has remained stable for US and UK participants. And in France, participants actually reported increases in well-being from April to May 2020. And another large sample of US participants did not report any changes in loneliness, but did report increases in perceived social support. And so given these mixed findings, we decided that understanding the psychological, social, circumstantial, and time use differences among people across the globe might help us to identify potential risk and protective factors for both well-being and social connection. So for example, we found that gratitude, resilience, grit, and flow were protective of well-being during the pandemic as these positive psychological characteristics may have helped people to cope. On the other hand, consulting a larger number, as well as spending more time engaging with online news sources, were shown to be risk factors for worse well-being, perhaps because overindulging in these news sources does less to quell our fears and at some point begins to fuel them. And for social connection, because many of us were and are sheltering in place in our homes, it appears that who we live with is protective of social connection. Particularly living with a partner was found to be especially protective of social connection, perhaps because of the support they lend during times of stress. And finally, one's occupation, such as being a healthcare worker, was found to be a risk factor for social isolation, perhaps because friends and family might avoid them due to the increased risk of COVID-19 exposure their profession involves. So this was just a small snippet of the impressive work being published on well-being and social connection during the pandemic. And while some have shown surprising resilience during the pandemic, others were tragically affected. And because we've seen inequality during the pandemic with some continuing to accrue immense wealth and others losing family members and jobs, we just encourage researchers to look at moderators and the everyday experiences of people across the globe as it will provide rich context and nuance to what's happening during COVID-19. Thank you all so much and happy World Happiness Day. We will now turn to chapter seven of the report and hear from Dr. Denev as he describes his chapter on work and well-being during COVID-19, impact, inequalities, resilience, and the future of work. Thank you, Lara, and I hope that you can actually see this screen. Excellent, good. Well, happy International Day of Happiness to, um, to all of you, and I hope you're coping well despite the challenging circumstances that we find ourselves in. Um, I had the privilege and pleasure to lead a stellar team of wonderful young scholars uh, from the LSE, uh, Oxford, and the MIT Sloan School, and we left no stone unturned in trying to figure out what the impact was um, of the COVID-19 pandemic on work, the world of work, and in turn, the well-being. Um, and so let me perhaps start by looking and considering the raw impact and making a few highlights as we go along. Um, in terms of impact, most economists would start by showing you the data on how um, unemployment figures will have risen, and they have. But I want to show you something else that I find even more striking, which is this. The number of job postings and their tremendous drop, their dramatic drop, I should say, uh, at the start of the pandemic. So we owe these data to our um, data partner for our, our workplace chapter, which is indeed.com, the large job search engine platform. And what you see here is at the start of the pandemic, there were about 50% less jobs being posted. Now, gradually jobs were coming back where the supply of jobs came back, but today we're still well below the levels that we would normally see in a normal year. As you can imagine, um, uh, not having a job or falling unemployed during the pandemic, 
mixed with um, um, half as few uh, jobs available to try and regain employment is a toxic mixture. And that is exactly what we find when we start delving into um, the degree of impact on people's well-being from being unemployed uh, and during the pandemic. So what you're seeing here is, is whether you live in South Korea, in Saudi Arabia, or the Netherlands, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're young or old, rich or poor, the impact of not having a job is um, devastating on people's well-being as measured through life satisfaction. Now, this ranges from a 10% drop in well-being to about 30% drop in well-being, depending on the context and the country that you live in. Now, that's the raw impact. Let's think a little bit about the inequalities, which were already highlighted uh, by John Clifton and John Halliwell and others. Now, um, we in the chapter dig deep into the unequal impacts on the workplace and the resulting well-being, but there's one insight that came through and that talks and links also with ultimately a source of resiliency, which is loneliness. What you're seeing here is a week by week tracking of people's well-being as they fall unemployed or stop work for some reason in the United Kingdom. What you're seeing here is the big fall and drop that we just discussed, but we split the sample between those people who had social support to begin with um, versus those that self-reported being lonely at the start and even before the pandemic began. Now, it's no surprise here maybe, although um, with what we've learned subsequently, but this was surprising when we first came across this, or at least thought it was striking, that there's about a 40% further impact in people's well-being if you don't have that social support to rely on as you are being made redundant from your work. Now, this is obviously exacerbated by the physical distancing rules that were put in place during the pandemic. So people that felt lonely were doubly impacted, essentially, uh, especially in the case of losing the social networks that they normally would otherwise have, one would hope, through work. So that's one aspect of unequal impacts across people and also hints at um, degrees and sources of resiliency. And that's what I want to turn to next. If you look at um, uh, resiliency, you have to start get a better understanding of what drives employee well-being to begin with. And here we've been able to benefit from a tremendous effort by uh, Indeed.com who started measuring workplace happiness, but not just workplace happiness, also the drivers of workplace happiness, dimensions such as uh, the ones that you're seeing here to the left of this graphic. There's a few important lessons to be learned or some insights that we think are relevant here and are worthwhile highlighting. The first thing to note is that um, it may be surprising to some of you to find that the relative importance of some dimensions of work are way more important. For example, a sense of belonging in your company, uh, having a friend to rely on, uh, the social capital that, and the quality relationships that you have, these kind of items really stand out. Flexibility has been uh, important throughout, well, from well before the pandemic, of course. Economists, however, may be slightly surprised, or others may be surprised to find that pay and how much you're paid on the job really only falls in the middle of the pack in terms of how important it is in driving uh, your sense of uh, satisfaction and happiness while at work. Now, um, a second insight from this is the stability, the resiliency of the drivers of employee well-being. So while there are some changes, the drivers before the onset of the pandemic stayed as important, if you will, uh, during and throughout, and hopefully one day post uh, pandemic. Um, so the companies that did well in uh, fostering a sense of belonging, offering flexibility and inclusivity, et cetera, will have likely coped better or their people will have coped better through, during this crisis. Maybe a final third insight is that while there's relative stability across the drivers, we did see some changes. And so if you look carefully in the margins, there are some intuitive changes. Sense of belonging became even more important. Flexibility, especially around March and April uh, came up and the supportive manager became a lot more important uh, during the pandemic as well. So these are some of the key insights from this very granular level of data analysis where we were able to track on a month to month basis. Many more lessons can be learned on this, uh, on the future work and how to build back happier, but we'll leave those for the deep dive session 
uh, in an hour or so. Back to you, Lara. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. What a, a lovely presentation and a, um, a teaser for the deep dive that follows. Um, so now we'll be hearing from Professor Laird uh, about Chapter 8, uh, which is entitled Living Long and Living Well, The Wellbe Approach. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, we like to think this is a very important chapter um, because it deals with an issue which is not usually uh, included uh, in the happiness approach to social welfare. And that's the, the obvious fact that uh, it matters hugely, not only how happy people are while they're alive, but for how long they manage to be alive and experience that happiness. So the question is, how should we combine length of life uh, and the average happiness uh, per year? And I think it's fairly obvious because what we would like for each person who's born is that they have the maximum well-being in each year and then they have as many years as possible uh, in which they experience that well-being. So just to introduce a bit of jargon, let's call a person's well-being in one year a well-being uh, well year or well-being. So then what would you want for each person is the maximum uh, total of their well-beings over their whole lifespan. Uh, so you could put that another way. What we would like is that they have a very high average well-being in each year, but also uh, a large number of years, and we'd multiply one by the other. And that is the obvious way in which we would get really a more complete measure of the performance of nations uh, than we've um, ever, ever, I think, uh, put forward uh, so far in the World Happiness Report. Um, we're going to measure the performance of nations, not just by the average well-being uh, of the population, but by the average well-being times the life expectancy of the population. So let me just tell you a few things which come out of that way of doing it. Um, what does it tell us first about how the human uh, uh, race has been doing over the last uh, 15 years? Um, average well-being, as you probably know, has been fairly stable. But life expectancy has changed enormously. Uh, it's gone up uh, to over 72. So it's an increase uh, over 15 years uh, of nearly four years in life expectancy. That's absolutely extraordinary uh, achievement. Uh, and I'll tell you where it happened in a moment. So plus four years, well, 3.7 to be precise, up to last year. Now this year, of course, we don't have the full figures, but if you uh, make uh, some assumptions, uh, you will find that life expectancy has probably gone down by about 0 0.3 years. So you can see that hasn't cancelled out uh, the huge gains uh, that have been happening over the last 15 years. Uh, the, the other really important thing about this is that life expectancy has increased in those areas which had A, the lowest life expectancy before, and also uh, well below average well-being. So if you're looking at well-beings per person as a measure of how a nation is doing, uh, you can see that the inequality, the world inequality of well-beings has come down r remarkably uh, over the last uh, 16 years. Uh, and that is something which we, we really uh, ought to celebrate. Uh, just finally then, uh, let me tell you about you know, the campaign, really, which we think of ourselves as engaged in, to get policymakers to use uh, well-be as their measure of the benefits of their policies. So what we want, of course, is for everybody who's already alive or who will be born, the maximum future well be per person. There's got to be a bit of discounting because the future is uncertain, but we don't uh, uh, use high discount rates as are used by many economists because we want to give proper weight to the, the, the welfare and well being of future generations. So, what we want to see policymakers do is take as the thing they're trying to maximize the uh, sum of all future well being per person discounted. Um, and and uh, to give an example, suppose a, a government's got a, a, a budget to spend, <clears throat> like finance ministers do, 
um, they should be evaluating um, all the different ways in which can be spent in different departments according to uh, the, the, the value of the future discounted well-beers uh, that would be generated uh, per dollar uh, spent on that particular policy. That should be the criterion for allocating money and for deciding policy priorities. Um, some of you who are in touch with uh, health economics can see that that's not that different from the quality adjusted life years procedures used by health economists, but we are proposing to use it for all policies uh, and all those affected by policies and, and the full well-being impact, not just the health related uh, quality of life. So I think that this is the way forward for public policy analysis, the well-being approach. Um, it's, it's set out a little more formally in, in an article in the British Medical Journal last year, uh, which Jan de Navy is the, the lead author. Um, many governments around the world are interested in this way of thinking about things, um, including, of course, the uh, coordinating organizations like the OECD and the European Union. Um, some governments are actually doing it, as you know, like New Zealand. And I'm pretty confident uh, that in 20 years time, this is the way in which the, the world will be evaluating policy priorities. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Richard. We'll now move to the question and answer period. Um, and I've received a number of questions um, sent by the SDSN team. So thank you for those who have posed them. Um, I think this question is most directly uh, towards the authors of chapter two. Um, and the, the question is from Rashad, Rashid Al-Shamari, who asks, every year the World Happiness Report normally compiles data from the previous three years of surveys to increase sample size and keep confidence bounds smaller. Um, and with that, we see Finland in the, at the top of the rankings, Denmark in second, Switzerland in third, and Iceland in fourth. This year, because of the pandemic, the team also reported how countries fared in 2020 only, uh, with Finland at number one and Iceland at number two. And so the specific question is about what is Iceland's global happiness ranking? Is it four or two? But I think the question might also be broader about the various conceptualizations and, and um, considerations of life evaluations. It's a good question, and we'll be dealing with it in the, the later session in more detail. Uh, but there has been some confusion in this year's report because the three-year average is the one with that we have as the official rankings. But since 2020 is COVID year, then we obviously wanted to look as much as we can at what's happening in 2020. However, we only have 95 countries directly surveyed. So you could see what would happen if we did our rankings solely based on the uh, 2020 rankings, uh, 2020 surveys, because of course we'd be missing out a third of the countries we normally do. So we felt it was appropriate to keep the three year average as the ranking because the rankings change so little from year to year, we didn't want a country to drop out of the ranking just because they hadn't had their 2020 uh, results in yet. Uh, so quite clearly the three year average is the appropriate one there are only small changes between the, the, the two. We presented all three rankings in the report, so you get to pick. If you really want to look at what's happening this year, you could look at the 2020 rankings on their own. But remember, there are a lot of countries not in it. Uh, so Luxembourg was up in the top 10 last year. It doesn't appear in the top 10 for 2020 because there wasn't a survey in Luxembourg. We don't know where it would be. Uh, so we, we want to stick with the large number uh, always. Uh, and uh, we spent a lot of our time, of course, looking at what was going on in detail in, the, in, the, in 2020. And we'll talk about that later. But thanks for raising the question. Uh, it's always a problem when you've got two different ways of providing the rankings, uh, that which one is the appropriate one. There's no question in our minds, the more appropriate one is the three year average still. Uh, and we'll carry on from there. 
Thank you. Um, the next question might be targeted to several uh, several authors. Um, it was about which question, which instruments used uh, were used to assess loneliness in the in the report. Um, so I thought this might be best targeted to Corinna, Sonia, and Jan if they wanted to speak to their chapters. But uh, I'll open it to anyone who'd like to respond. Hi, I'll just start by saying that um, the UCLA loneliness scale is a very popular measure of loneliness that was used in quite a few studies. It has items like, you know, I feel lonely, I feel isolated, um, people are um, around me but not with me. Um, but there's other measures that are getting at a sense of connection, um, you know, uh, items like I feel close to people in my life, um, I feel connected. So there's a variety of scales, but I think the UCLA loneliness is the most popular one. I don't know if Karina or Jan want to add to that. Uh, very briefly, perhaps, but uh, backing up, Sonia, uh, in our in our study, the UCL COVID social study, it was also the UCLA loneliness short scale, which is a three item. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move to the next question, then I think we have a few more minutes. Um, one question is uh, to, to Jan. Are the findings um, from the chapter you reported here comparable globally regarding loneliness, loss of work, and life satisfaction as observed in the UK? Oh wow, that's a great question, and it's an empirical question. And I wish I have the, the I wish I had the answer to it. Uh, normally, we would very much rely on the Gallup World Poll data, so maybe we should dig back into it because I think the the answer may be part of the Gallup World Poll data. But John had exclusive access for the rankings. Um, we had to rely on more um, uh, separated data sets to get at this. And so the, uh, the impact on well-being split by loneliness, we had in very granular level, thanks to uh, Daisy Fancourt's efforts with the UCL COVID social study. My sense is that, we, that this will replicate uh, across other countries and contexts, no matter which region in the world, uh, being lonely to begin with and not having social support outside of work will not help you when you're being made redundant from a job or without work. Uh, and especially so in, in the context of a pandemic where physical distancing uh, uh, rules are being applied. So my sense is that this will be very much something that travels outside the UK, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Um, I, I received one larger, broader question that I'll pose, although the three minutes might not be enough to respond, but I, it might be worth giving it a shot. Um, there is a question here saying, what are we going to be doing about the long-term consequences of COVID on, on overall happiness? What can we learn from the data um, and this crisis in terms of well-being? Uh, um, Go ahead, Richard. I, th I think it, it is a huge opportunity, of course, because people have been reassessing um, what things really matter to them. And I think that the kind of uh, lessons that John was bringing out about the importance of social connections is something that um, has probably uh, impinged on almost everybody in, on the planet. Uh, they've realized more than they did before just how crucial that is and how high a priority that should be uh, when weighed against other things like uh, getting a better job or getting uh, a higher income or a, a bigger house. So I think there really is a chance that we will have a society in which individuals uh, make better choices, but also in which governments are more willing to think about what matters to people, because I think that people um, are uh, concerned, uh, as we know from the happiness research, um, much more about uh, things like health and human relationships relative to income than politicians think they are. And I think that the, that the politicians who respond to what we know uh, really matters to people by providing them with support in those areas uh, will be the ones who get support. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, I think there is one last question, um, and, and I believe John Clifton may, may want to respond to an earlier one, but I'll, I'll pose one last one that was received. Um, and I, uh, the, I, maybe it would go to John Helliwell, maybe to John Clifton, I'm not sure. Um, but there was a question asking uh, where in the report might readers be able to find, if it is available, data on when uh, questions were collected within each country um, under the understanding that the timing of data collection or, or uh, measurement assessment may matter for obvious reasons, given the ebb and flow of COVID this year. 
That's a very good question. And uh, we have put together an appendix, which we will post on the site, showing the center month of every country's collection. Typically, it spread into a month or two, but most of them were centered on a particular month. So it's then possible to go in and see. We have not gone as deep as we might have because the reports have been coming in um, piece by piece. We don't ha quite yet have them all, uh, but I think there's some <clears throat> deeper analysis to do about the differences in the month when the thing was taken because we do notice there's some changes in all of the emotions and the evaluations during the stages of the pandemic. So uh, we will put that data out there and we'll also be doing more analysis on that potential link between the timing of the interviews and the consequences. Given the overall lack of change, it's not gonna be a huge part of the story, but it's an important part nonetheless. To John's point, we also make the Gallup's methodology available on our website. So you can see the exact timing of when the interviews were conducted. And also to John's point, you can see fascinating trends. Take China, for example. When we look at how people rate their lives today and how they rate their lives in the next five years, the way that people in China are rating their lives are higher now than they ever have been in the history of our tracking. Now, a big aspect of any analysis would be, well, when was, that, when was that conducted? And it was in the fall of 2020. Same is true in Sweden. When we look at those two metrics in Sweden, they're flat year over year. And the reason might be is because of the timing when we did it at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so yes, please make sure that you look at all the dates. And the last thing is in the United States from just the one data point that we did as part of the Gallup World Poll, the data are also slightly, they look flat. Um, but in the United States, we also have a separate tracker where we do this on a much more frequent basis. And you can see that there were extreme changes throughout the year. And in fact, it was probably one of the most volatile years we've ever seen in the history of our tracking. Last point I'll make in the questions of loneliness. I did want to bring up one that we have tested in the past, but we haven't been able to fund it today. But one question that we asked before the pandemic on loneliness is in a typical week, how many friends do you interact with? This can be in person, on the phone, through a computer, or any other way. We found that 6% of people said zero to that question. And I think it's another question that helps further understand the global state of loneliness. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for those questions and responses. I'm now going to pass the microphone back to Professor Sachs for our closing. So, Lara, I will not discuss my chapter at this point, or that's in the next section, right? That will be in the next section. Great. Well, uh, thank you uh, for fa fantastic uh, presentations to everybody, uh, and uh, also for great questions and a very active chat. I, I do want to say that I think that the uh, new Welby approach of, uh, uh, of Richard Layard is going to become uh, a, uh, a gold standard for the future. Uh, you know, it, uh, Richard, it goes back, uh, I would say, uh, two centuries to Jeremy Bentham's attempt to do this. And of course, the uh, inventor of utilitarianism, Jeremy Bentham said, we should pursue the greatest good for the greatest number and a very worthy idea. And he didn't quite know how to measure this uh, because John Clifton didn't uh, cut him in on the survey. So uh, the problem was for Bentham that he didn't have metrics. Uh, he wanted a measure of pain and pleasure. Uh, that didn't quite uh, pan out. So he didn't have a way to measure well-being so systematically. But because of the breakthroughs that have been made in psychology and in survey data, we now have serious ways to do uh, what we've wanted to do for a long time, which is to measure happiness in society and then use it uh, as the basis for legislation, as Bentham said. So what uh, Richard Layard is uh, putting forward is uh, the next step of the analytical way to incorporate these data into policy analysis it is uh, very much related uh, to what the public health uh, specialists have done uh, with the quality adjusted life years, which turned out to be an extremely fruitful approach. 
uh, and one that has helped to guide public policy priority setting for the last 20 years. And I think we are going to make very serious advances on measuring social well being through a kind of well be approach. So I want to underscore that from uh, John Helliwell and uh, all of the rest of the colleagues. We've learned what are the constituents that help to shape happiness. And from Richard Layard, we're learning how to apply these measures quantitatively and systematically. And I think that this is a, a tremendous advance, certainly a tremendous advance on our standard approach of uh, gross domestic product, which we know is so flawed uh, that it's almost uh, meaningless or sometimes absolutely counterproductive to what we really want to achieve for good lives. Uh, but this is a, a real breakthrough. I want to thank all of the uh, authors for wonderful chapters. Uh, and uh, the, the great chapters on uh, the determinants of mental health uh, in this crisis. Uh, thank you so much on the importance of social connectedness, uh, on uh, the differing experiences in different parts of the world. I think we're gonna take a short break right now. And when we come back, I'm going to say a few words about uh, why it is <laughs> that the Asia Pacific countries seem to have done well, not seem to have done, have done so much better than the countries of the North Atlantic region, uh, Europe and the United States in containing this pandemic, because that too gives us some real lessons about social organization, about culture and about politics. So we'll talk about that when we come back from the break. read uh, in the World Happiness Report 2020, the impact of COVID-19 on human happiness is quite dramatic in terms of health, well-being, work, income, and social lives. So what can we do? As individuals, we can adapt seeking eudaimonia, as the ancient Greek taught us. A more altruistic, virtuous, and moderate life. But even more important, we can build a better future. Because this crisis is now systemic. Besides climate, health, economy, financial, it's becoming a social crisis. In one world, the entire world became systemically unsustainable. So we need to transition our society from the past present extractive model in which uh, we keep extracting resources from uh, the ecosystems into a regenerative society where we can not only preserve but start rebuilding natural capital. This is exactly what the regenerative society aims to do. With Regeneration 2030, we want to trigger this transition to a regenerative society by addressing first regenerative agriculture, land and water regeneration, urban regeneration, and ultimately the regenerative industry. Davines is proud for the second year in a row to uh, sponsor and facilitate a World Happiness Report. Um, we think it's a very important uh, report uh, that once a year allow us to reflect on the status and on the health of our world in a period where interdependence, convergence and uh, big themes uh, like the role of, uh, of men on the planet and uh, uh, post-globalization, the role of economies and uh, societies have uh, in the world. It's a great honor to be part of uh, this uh, report and uh, a big thank to all the scientists, all the academics that, uh, that work on it. For Davines, happiness is uh, beauty, ethics and sustainability. Our way of uh, looking at happiness is uh, eudaimonic and uh, eudaimonia means uh, uh, life flourishing. Uh, in our um, 
organization which we try to pursue eudaimonia for all um, people uh, working with us and uh, beauty ethics and sustainability for us means uh, it's a different way to say people planet prosperity hi everyone Gallup is proud to contribute the data for the World Happiness Report every year, and from the first report in 2012 to the ninth report this year. But what we're most proud of is what we did last year. The global pandemic forced us to completely rethink how we survey the world. There was even a question as to whether or not we could do it. But if there was ever a time when we needed to keep listening and reporting on what people worldwide were thinking and feeling, it was 2020. The questions we ask about people's well-being which are the focus of today's report, are the questions that leaders and policymakers desperately needed answered. We found a way to do it safely and still maintain our high standards of data quality. It was far from easy, but we were successfully able to switch from face-to-face -face interviewing to telephone interviewing in countries where telephone interviewing is not the norm. The report today features data from 95 of the 116 countries we ultimately were able to survey in 2020. This latest World Happiness Report tells a unique story of what the world is feeling during an unprecedented time in our shared history. These data capture the essence of the world's well-being and the resilience of the human spirit. Thank you for reading this important report and happy International Happiness Day. Hi, I'm Ian Maskell, the guy that runs Walls Ice Cream here at Unilever. It's a real pleasure to be with you all on the International Day of Happiness. At the launch of the 2020 World Happiness Report, I announced the launch of Wall's Human Happiness Movement, our commitment to make the world a happier, more inclusive place, one street at a time. The last 12 months have been crazy and quite a journey for Wall's. In January 2021, we launched our Manifesto for a Happier World, a significant piece of global research examining how perceptions of happiness changed during lockdown with compelling evidence that people recognised the importance of social connections and community support as drivers of their personal happiness. People learned that they can choose happiness in times of great challenge. At Walls, we believe that the return to normal is a pivotal moment for human happiness. Do we go back to looking for happiness in all the wrong places, money, possessions and more stuff? Or do we choose to build back happier by connecting with friends, family and our community. Our human happiness movement calls on everyone to grasp the things that truly makes us happy and prioritise them above everything else. The World Happiness Report is a crucial stepping stone towards a happier world. To Richard, Geoffrey, John, Jan Emanuel, Vanessa and Sharon and everyone else involved, a heartfelt thank you for welcoming us into your community we feel blessed. Watch this space for plenty more happiness from Walls in 2021 and beyond. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paul Wolf, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Human Resources at Indeed. We're so proud to be a sponsor and data contributor for this year's World Happiness Report. Our mission is to help people get jobs. After an unprecedented year of work around the globe, it is more important than ever to understand how people are feeling in the workplace. This is especially true for those who are currently looking for work at a new company. Understanding what drives happiness and well being at work is critical to individuals, businesses, and society as a whole. By measuring and sharing these metrics, we hope to bring more transparency for both job seekers and employers and to ultimately work towards creating a happier world of work for everyone.